You're holding the wrong man. What do you mean I'm holding the wrong man? I got the motive which is money and the body which is dead. Hello to all the classic people that are returning. I'm glad you're back. I want to welcome any new visitors and let you know that there will be spoilers ahead. Today on Classic Movie Review, we are taking on In the Heat of the Night. They call me Mr. Pig! Not that one. This one. They call me Mr. Tibbs. This excellent mystery drama deals with systematic racism. The cast for this film was blessed by the acting gods. I want to give a big shout out to David and Robert. They contacted me following the death of Sidney Poitier in January 2022. I bumped this movie up the list as a small tribute to the great actor and his pivotal roles. I have added all of your recommendations to the list and there are so many good ones. I wish I could get to them faster. Please continue to write in and comment. It is greatly appreciated. Today's film won five Oscars. Best Picture, Best Actor in a Leading Role, Rod Steiger, Best Writing, Screenplay Based on Material from Another Medium, Sterling Siliphant, Best Sound, Samuel Goldwyn Sound Department, and Best Film Editing, Hal Ashby. It was also nominated for Best Director, Norman Jewison, and Best Effects, Sound Effects, James Richards, but did not win in these last two categories. This movie has a very good 8.0 rating on imdb.com. On RottenTomatoes.com, today's film has an astounding 95% on the tomato meter and 92% audience approval. New York Times film critic Bosley Carruthers wrote in an August 3rd, 1967 review. Director, quote, Jewison has taken a hard, outspoken script prepared by Sterling Siliphant and with stinging performances contributed by Rod Steiger as the chief of police, and Sidney Poitier is the detective, he has turned it into a film that has the look and sound of actuality and the pounding pulse of truth. The line of its fascination is not so much its melodramatic plot. It is not in the touch-and-go discovery by the detective who it was that bumped off the prominent northern industrialist in town to start an integrated mill, or in the gauntlet of perils of bodily injury from snarling rednecks that Mr. Poitier consistently run. Actually, the mystery story is a rather routine and arbitrary one and it is brought to a hasty conclusion in a flurry of coincidences and explanation that leave one confused and unconvinced. The fascination of it is the crackling confrontation between the arrogant small-town white policeman with all the layers of ignorance and prejudice and the sophisticated Negro detective with his steely armor of contempt and mistrust. Fascinating, too, are the natures and details of other characters who swarm and sweat through a crisis in a believable Mississippi town. Warren Oates and Peter Whitney as raw cops, William Charette and Larry Gates as powerful whites, Scott Wilson as a renegade redneck, and Quentin Dean as a slippery little slut. Unquote. Come on, man. It's bad enough that you use Negro, but I understand it was a time. But to call a 16-year-old girl a slippery little slut? She may be redneck and slippery as hell, but she's a victim here, too. Actors. Right. And I'm a Shakespearean actor. Sidney Poitier is absolutely fantastic as Detective Virgil Tibbs. Although this great actor was first covered in Band of Angels 1957, that is not one of his best movies. In the Heat of the Night 1967 stands, in my opinion, as one of his most influential roles, along with Lilies of the Field 1963, the Bedford Incident, 1965, To Sir With Love, 1967, and Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, 1967. Rod Steiger was at the top of his form as the racist chief of police, Gillespie. This great actor was covered in one of his many significant roles in The Harder They Fall, 1956. In the role of Gillespie, Steiger seems to be modeled after the Mississippi racist sheriff, Cecil Price, who was indicted in the murder of civil rights workers Cheney, Goodman, and Swarner in 1964. Much of this was fictionalized in Mississippi Burning, 1988. Cecil Price was a sheriff of Neshoba County, located along the GMO line in central Mississippi. The scene of the murder was Philadelphia, Mississippi. Detective Tibbs is from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and I don't think this is by accident. Lee Grant presented a strong character as Mrs. Colbert, 
Grant was first covered in Maroon 1969. Minor roles include William Chalorette as Mayor Schubert. Chalorette was first covered in Shield for Murder 1954. Harry Dean Stanton was an uncredited police officer. Stanton was first covered in Red Dawn 1984. Peter Whitney played Courtney. Whitney was first covered in Three Strangers 1946. The iconic grinning Warren Oates played the role of police officer Sam Wood. Oates was born in Kentucky in 1928. Oates graduated from high school in Louisville and served in the United States Marine Corps from 1946 to 48. He attended the University of Louisville where he became interested in theater. In 1954, Oates moved to New York to look for work as an actor. He began to work in dramas, but his thick southern accent pushed him towards westerns. This great character actor could switch between goofs and crazed tough guys. His movies include Ride the High Country 1962, The Troubled Major Dundee 1965, The Unfortunate Return of the Seven 1966, In the Heat of the Night 1967, A Very Bloody but Fantastic The Wild Bunch 1969, Tulane Blacktop 1971, Badland 1973, Dillinger 1973, Bring Me the Head of Alfredo Garcia 1974, Stripes 1981 as Sergeant Holka, The Great Helicopter Movie Blue Thunder 1983, and Tough Enough 1983. Oates passed away from a heart attack in his sleep at the very young age of 53 in 1982. Anthony James played Greasy Spoon worker Ralph. James was born in 1942 in South Carolina. Both his parents were Greek immigrants. Standing over six and a half feet tall with an angular pockmarked face, James was cast into a series of creepy roles. These roles began within the heat of the night, 1967, Vanishing Point, 1971, as a slimy killer hitchhiker, The Culpeper County Company, 1972, High Plains Drifter, 1973, the Teacher 1974, Burn Offerings 1976, and Ravengers 1979. He was popular on television from the late 1960s through the early 1990s. Later films include Blue Thunder 1983, World Gone Wild 1987, The Naked Gun Two and a Half, The Smell of Fear 1991, and Unforgiven 1992. James's first and last movie both won the Oscar for Best Picture. He died in 2020. Scott Williams played Harvey Oberst, a murder suspect. I will not discuss him other than to say he was masterful as Herschel on The Walking Dead, 2010 to 2018. Story. Let me explain. No, there is too much. Let me sum up. This movie opens and hits like a ton of bricks. Legendary singer Ray Charles belts out In the Heat of the Night, a song composed by Quincy Jones and written by Marilyn and Alan Bergman. A GMO, Guff Mobile in Ohio, train steams through the night. Two lines ran across Mississippi, eventually hitting St. Louis and Chicago. The eastern track runs through Corinth, Mississippi, which I have always suspected was the fictitious town of Sparta. Just for perspective, directly across the Tennessee line is Savannah, Tennessee, the home of Sheriff Buford Pusser, who was fictionalized in Walking Tall 1973, Walking Tall Part 2 1975, Final Chapter Walking Tall 1977, and, unfortunately, Walking Tall 2004. Just for the record, I've taken the tour of the Pusser home, and it was very similar to Pee Wee's Alamo tour. This is the actual chair that Buford sat in. The train passes the welcome sign for Sparta, Mississippi, before it stops in the town. But you know you're not really welcome. You can figuratively feel the sweat as the train arrives. A well-dressed black man exits the train and enters the station waiting room. In a filthy, greasy spoon, cook Ralph, Anthony James, is killing flies with a rubber band. Police officer Sam Wood, Warren Oates, is having a soda and asking for a pie slice. The flawed Ralph has hidden the pie to harass the officer. Sam does not like Ralph and he makes him call him Officer Wood. Wood returns to his car to patrol the sleepy town. He turns his contraband portable radio off and kills the patrol lights as he stops in front of a lit house. A naked girl in the house can see Sam watching her, and she doesn't mind. The girl is 16-year-old Dolores Purdy, Quentin Dean, but she looks 30. Sam returns to his patrol and heads downtown. 
Sam stops the car as he sees a dead body lying in the street. He touches the dead man's blood before calling into headquarters. Sheriff Gillespie, Rod Steiger, a photographer, and the local doctor begin processing the murder scene. Gillespie is in charge and has contempt for everyone else. The victim is Philip Colbert, a northerner who was going to build a factory in the town of Sparta. Sam confirms that there is no identification or witnesses to the crime. Gillespie sends Sam to look for strangers and check local hangouts. Sam eventually arrives at the train depot where Virgil Tibbs, Sidney Poitier, waits to catch his train north. Sam begins with, On your feet, boy! And I mean now! Even though both men are about the same age. Sam pulls a gun on Tibbs and searches him. When Sam finds Tibbs' wallet full of money, he arrests him. Tibbs is detained and brought to the police station where Gillespie is more concerned with fixing the air conditioner than solving the murder. Gillespie sees Tibbs' money and is sure he is guilty. Got a name, boy? Virgil Tibbs. Virgil. <laughs> I don't think we're going to have any trouble, are we, Virgil? No trouble at all. Tibbs says that he was visiting his mother and is heading back home. Under interrogation, Tibbs reveals that he makes good money as a police officer in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Gillespie sees Tibbs' badge. He calls in Sam and chews him out for not checking the suspect. Gillespie calls Tibbs' boss to verify his story. Courtney, Peter Whitney, is another inept officer at the station. The photographer brings in the pictures of the murdered man. Sam lets Tibbs see the pictures of the victim. Tibbs is brought into Gillespie's office to speak with his boss. His boss in Philadelphia insists that he stay and help with the investigation. Both Tibbs and Gillespie try to avoid working with each other. Since Tibbs is a homicide expert, Gillespie finally asks him to help by examining the body. Tibbs and Gillespie go to the Undertaker's, where the dead body is stored. It is clear immediately that Tibbs is an expert as he checks the body. He asks for the proper investigation equipment. The doctor and the mortician don't want to help, but when Tibbs shows that rigor mortis has begun and the time of the death was earlier than they first projected and makes the chief look good, the two men fall into line. Toothpaste, cop, what's going on here, chief? Who is this boy anyway? I asked him to look at the body, that's who he is. And would you feel the face and jaw, please? Am I mistaken or has rigor begun? Yeah. You'll notice, too, that post-mortem lividity is present here in the lower portion, so the time of death really has to be earlier, wouldn't you say? Oh. Well, we'll be able to pinpoint that as soon as I get up thermometer. As you know, the loss of heat from the brain is the most reliable way of determining time of death. Right, Chief? Oh, yeah. Gillespie gets a call about another suspect and leaves Tibbs to finish the autopsy. Now daylight, Harvey Obris, Scott Wilson runs from the police and a pack of bloodhounds. Harvey tries to make it across the river into Arkansas. However, Gillespie arrests Oberst on the bridge. Sometimes later, Tibbs arrives at the police station and is told by Courtney that Mrs. Colbert, Lee Grant, is waiting in the chief's office and doesn't know about her husband's death. Against advice, Tibbs goes in to talk to Mrs. Colbert. She is extremely agitated, and then Tibbs gives her the news. Tibbs is very kind and professional. There's an important note in the conclusions about this scene. Gillespie comes in with Oberst and thinks he is done with Tibbs. Tibbs asks to examine Oberst. He is sure that Oberst is not the killer because he is left-handed. Tibbs knows that the blow came from a right-handed man. Oberst could have come along after the crime, found it, picked it up. I don't know. That's what the boy said he did. Well, I'm sorry, man, but I said different. Well, when I examined the deceased, it was obvious that the fatal blow was struck from an angle of 17 degrees from the right, which makes it almost certain the person who did it is right-handed. So what? Old Harv's left-handed, Chief. Everybody in town knows that. Oberst had the victim's wallet, but he said he just picked it up beside the body. Tibbs explains how Oberst could not be the killer. Mrs. Colbert is very impressed with Tibbs' knowledge. Gillespie orders Tibbs to be taken to the train station. The chief orders Tibbs arrested for refusing to hand over evidence. Obris doesn't want to share a cell with Tibbs and is shocked when he finds out Tibbs is in law enforcement. 
Obrist has an alibi. He was playing pool. He says that he'd been arrested before because Dolores Purdy took her clothes off and that Sam Wood warned him to stay away from Dolores. Gillespie and Wood come and release Tibbs. Tibbs says Oberst is innocent and that Colbert was killed somewhere else and dropped on Main Street. Well, you're pretty sure of yourself, ain't you, Virgil? Uh, Virgil, that's a funny name for a young boy that comes from Philadelphia. What did they call you up there? They call me Mr. Tibbs. Mayor Sherbert, William Chalaret, calls Gillespie over and has Mrs. Colbert in his office. She demands that Tibbs be left on the case under the threat of not building the factory. Following the mayor's advice, the chief puts Tibbs back on the case. Gillespie has to go to the train station and talk Tibbs into returning. Gillespie says the town needs the factory because there will be jobs for blacks and whites. Gillespie gets Tibbs a car so he can continue to investigate the murder. Even the local blacks don't know what to think of Tibbs. Prominent white townsmen meet with the mayor and Gillespie and threaten Tibbs' life. Tibbs meets with Mrs. Colbert and finds out that Endicott, Larry Gates, who was at the meeting, was the main enemy of Mr. Colbert because he opposed an integrated factory and the general loss of his racially generated power. Tibbs examines the murdered man's car. He finds dried blood, mud, and a piece of fern root that gives him the idea of where the killing occurred. Gillespie and Tibbs go to Endicott's plantation, complete with a black lawn jockey. The two men are taken to Endicott's greenhouse by his black butler. Tibbs disarms Endicott by admiring his orchids. Endicott compares the need to care for orchids to the white man's need to care for blacks. Have you a favorite, Mr. Tibbs? Well, I am partial to any of the epiphytics. Why, isn't that remarkable? That of all the orchids in this place, you should prefer the epiphytics. I wonder if you know why. Maybe it would be helpful if you'd tell me. Because, like the Negro, they need care and feeding and cultivating. And that takes time. That's something you can't make some people understand. That's something Mr. Colbert didn't realize. Endicott says that Colbert didn't understand this need to care for a race. Endicott finally realizes that he's being questioned about the murder of Colbert. Endicott slaps Tibbs, and Tibbs slaps him back. Gillespie and the butler are paralyzed by the action, and Endicott says he could have had Tibbs shot in the past for touching him. After the two lawmen leave, Endicott's black butler shakes his head at Endicott in shame. Outside, in what I believe is the film's pivotal moment, Tibbs says he wants to pull the fat cat Endicott down. Gillespie says, Man, you're just like the rest of us. I can pull that fat cat down. I can bring him right off this hill. Oh, boy. Man, you're just like the rest of us. It hits Tibbs like a ton of bricks. Gillespie meets with the mayor and is told that the last police chief would have shot Tibbs for slapping Endicott. Tibbs is driving on River Road when he is set upon by four rednecks in a car with a rebel flag tag. Gillespie drives out to rescue Tibbs, who he is sure is in trouble. Tibbs runs into an abandoned factory and is soon surrounded by the attackers. Against the wall is a safety sign. Tibbs uses a pipe to defend himself against the four men. Gillespie strolls in and stops the attack. Gillespie then stands up to the racial taunts and punches one of the men. That night, Tibbs gets into Woods' patrol car and asks him to follow the route he drove the night of the murder. Ralph is at the diner robbing the jukebox for free songs. Seeing Wood coming, Ralph hides the pie. Before the two men can get inside, Gillespie arrives and is furious that Tibbs is still in town. The three men go into the diner. Ralph refuses to serve Tibbs because of his race. The three men continue to follow Wood's patrol route. Virgil notices that Wood changes the route skipping the part where he sat in front of Dolores' house watching her show. Later, Gillespie checks the bank and finds out that Wood made a large deposit the day after the murder. Sometime in the morning, Tibbs comes in and says he can prove that the murderer was in Endicott's greenhouse. Gillespie says he already has Wood arrested for the murder. Wood says he got the money from three years of gambling. Tibbs says he knows Wood changed the route so a black man would not see a naked white girl. Tibbs tells the chief that he is making a mistake arresting Wood. I'm afraid you're a little late, Virgil. We already got the guilty man. Who? Oh. Sam. <laughs> Sam. That's right. Our man is Endicott. 
You just think a minute. Didn't you catch Sam in a lie last night? And yesterday he goes ahead and makes a big cash deposit at the bank. And if I told you once, I told you a hundred times that I won that money matching quarters and halves, and it took me three years to do it. Lloyd Purdy, James Patterson, comes in dragging his sister Dolores and demands to see the chief about Sam Wood. Purdy says Dolores is pregnant and Wood is the father. Tibbs enters the room to the chagrin of everyone involved. Dolores says Wood comes by every night. One night he stops at her house. He invites her to a cemetery where they had sex. Purdy makes out that his sister has been shamed because a black man was in the room. Tibbs goes to the cell and asks Obris where someone can get an abortion in the town. Obris sends word to his friend Packy, Matt Clark, to tell Tibbs the name of the black woman that provides abortions. Lloyd and the Rednecks are gathering to attack Tibbs again in another part of town. Tibbs is at the factory site and Gillespie finds him there. Tibbs says the story from Dolores made him realize that Endicott was not the killer and in fact, Colbert was killed at the proposed factory site. He convinces Gillespie because Wood could not have driven two cars back to town. Yeah, he heard, he turned and he got smashed. He was hit from behind. If Dolores Purdy hadn't come into your office, I never would have seen the truth. I was hung up trying to get Endicott for personal reasons. You're holding the wrong man. What do you mean I'm holding the wrong man? I got the motive which is money and the body which is death. What makes you so sure? Why do you doubt it? Because Colbert was killed here, then driven back to town in his own car and dumped on the streets. Sam couldn't have driven two cars. Two carloads of rednecks are out looking for Tibbs. Tibbs and Gillespie bond over a bit of wild turkey, but Gillespie recalls at becoming friends with the only similar intellect in town. Pecky arrives at the chief's house and takes Tibbs to the abortionist. Tibbs tells Gillespie he is going where Whitey ain't allowed. Tibbs goes alone to see Madame Kaliba, Bea Richards, at a general store. People around here call me Mama Kaliba. Mama, I'm not from around here, but you can put me on my train. You talk crazy. You're gin drunk. Just homesick. Lord, Lord. Whisper two little words, Mama, and I'm on my way. Maybe. I don't want to sever a beautiful child like you right out. He asks for the man's name that is paying for Dolores' abortion. Mama says Tibbs is working for Mr. Charlie, slang for a white man. Tibbs says that the man that paid for the abortion had more money and he killed Colbert. Tibbs says he won't have her arrested if she gives the information. Mama says she doesn't know the boy's name, but Dolores is coming by that night for the treatment. No sooner is that said than Dolores enters the business. When she sees Tibbs, she runs away. Tibbs runs her down and catches her. A man in the shadows pulls a gun on Tibbs. It is Ralph. The two carloads of rednecks arrive and are about to kill Tibbs. Lloyd is holding a gun on the detective. Tibbs says that Dolores has abortion money from Ralph in her purse and that Woods was set up by the pair of lovers. Lloyd finds the money and is about to shoot Ralph, but is beaten to the draw as Ralph shoots him first. At the station, Ralph confesses to the murder of Colbert. I didn't mean to kill him. Gillespie takes Tibbs to the train. As a show of respect, he carries Tibbs' bag and tells him to take care, you hear? Well, got your ticket? Yeah. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Virgil. You take care. You hear? Conclusion. Due to the racial threats against Sidney Poitier, this movie was filmed primarily in Sparta, Illinois. Poitier is said to have slept with a pistol under his pillow during the filming, out of concern for the threats. On his YouTube channel, Aaron Hunter points out the importance of the scene where Tibbs comforts Mrs. Colbert. This film was made 12 years after 14-year-old Emmett Till was lynched for looking at a white woman in public. The scene where Tibbs goes to meet with Madame Calibra is reminiscent of something in my past. One time when we were visiting my grandmother in Georgia, me and one of my sisters, and I think two of my girl cousins, were sent to the conjure woman's house. In this case, it was to remove warts from my hand. 
We had to walk down there to the woman's house in the dark and knock on the door. Thank God she was not home and I never got to visit the conjure woman. World famous short summary, just like the Fox and the Hound, 1981. This show is now completely free and independent, brought to you without ads. If you enjoy the show, please subscribe and leave a review where you get your podcasts. It really helps the show get found. As a technical note, references and citations are listed for each show on the site at ClassicMovieRev.com. Beware the Moors. <laughs>